but in relation uh, to COVID, and of course on Monday uh, afternoon, the Prime Minister announced a Royal Commission of Inquiry into the um, COVID response. Uh, I think it was needed, and many people have been calling for a Royal Commission, and it will be independent, as much as a Royal Commission can be. It starts in February, it won't report back till mid twenty. 24, which gives it a lot of time, I would imagine, to consider a lot of things. If there has been criticism of, of it, it has been the scope and some would say the prohibitions on what the Commission can't look into. And joining, well, quite a few voices who are talking in concerned tones about that have been the New Zealand Initiative, um, the think tank, lobby group, group, uh, the New Zealand Initiative, which represents uh, quite a few businesses and um, quite a few New Zealanders, well, uh, not without means, I think would be the nice way to put it, the euphemism. Well, joining us now to discuss what the New Zealand Initiatives are about the Royal Commission, we are joined uh, by one of its founders, uh, Roger Partridge. Roger, uh, welcome to the platform. Lovely to have you with us. Good morning, Sean. All right. What don't you like? Well, no, let's start. No, let's start on another day. Do you agree that there should have been a Royal Commission and it's good that we've got one? Yeah, yes, I do. And look, before I express a view on that, can I just say the initiative is not a lobby group and we don't represent business interests. We're funded by business. Uh -huh. We're a, an evidence-based research think tank. Okay, um, but, but hey, 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 hang on, I've got to take you on here, Roger. You're on here talking about your views. That's lobbying in the public space. If you were just a research group, you just put out papers. Lob lobbying is on behalf of somebody. I'm, we're not lobbying. Oh, okay, on all right. Of well, let's say you lobby on behalf of the ideas that you generate through your think tank. How about that? I'm happy with that. All right. Okay, we've cleared that anyway, up. Anyway, so the, the so the Royal Commission. Your question. It's great that we're having a Royal Commission uh, after closing our border for more than two years and locking down our biggest city cumulatively for s more than six months. We couldn't avoid one. Um, and especially when part of the reason for such strict measures was the poor state of the country's pandemic preparedness, including a, a health system that lacked resilience. We had mm. one of the lowest number of um, ICU beds in the OECD per capita. Yeah. So and we indeed, indeed, that yeah. was, from the government's projection, almost the sole rationale. Everything we had to do was to stop the collapse of our health system. Yes, although every every country's health system risked collapsing, I, I, but but ours was particularly vulnerable, um, and we had a unique opportunity as an island um, to buy time. Uh, whether we use that time well, well, that's something that the Royal Commission should look at. Okay, so what is it? You say it's good we're having a, a Royal Commission. What is it you don't like about its terms of reference? Is it stuff that well, it's looking into that it shouldn't? or that it can't look into that it should? Uh, well, it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of... Uh, it, well, it's the latter, but, but my, my first worry about the Royal Commission is just how independent it is. Um, Professor Blakely that chairs it is by no means the independent chair you might expect on a Royal Commission. He's been a regular media commentator in New Zealand and has sought to influence our pandemic response. Occasionally even writing in conjunction with Professor Michael Baker, who will be known to all of your listeners mm -hmm. or viewers. We had him on the other day, yep. And he's also been very closely associated with Victoria's pandemic response. So if we were looking to compare, say, the impact on well-being of New Zealand's approach with Sweden's, then Professor Blakely already has a clearly articulated preference. And what you want with a royal commission, especially with a with a pandemic response that's caused quite a, a degree of division in the country, is as much independence as you can get. And that's why royal commissions typically are chaired by members of the judiciary who haven't ha haven't got skin in the game on the decisions that have been made. So I have a I, I have something of a, a, a reservation about the Roger extent. When you put it like that, yeah, when you put it like that, I think that's a genuine concern. And I guess the problem is there was some similarity to Victoria's approach that Roger Blakely was involved in developing and the approach here. So sheer human nature would suggest 
he would be unlikely to criticise a mirror image or a doppelganger of the system that he was involved in. That's a well, clear that's conflict. The, that's the risk. Yeah, now, uh, that's the risk. I've got no doubt about his professional integrity whatsoever. It's just as a matter of human nature, he's been... To create the appearance of independence, somebody less in, with less skin in the game would have been preferable. All right, all right. So you're worried about the chair of the Royal Commission, and I would agree that a judge would seem to be a good a, a good person to do this. In fact, I was thinking about a lawyer. I don't know, don't know if he's a, he's a judge yet uh, who used to work with me at Fair Go and has done a lot with the New Zealand Medical Council. Uh, I'm not going to have his name out on air, but I can think of a number of people involved in the judiciary who have some ancillary experience and knowledge who would have been good good for this role. Do you think, therefore, Roger, that uh, Blakely's appointment was a political one and a deliberate move by the government to possibly influence the outcome or to reduce criticism that might come from the Royal Commission? Well, I, I think people have got to draw their own conclusions about that, um, but I can see why he would, he would be attractive to the government. All right, all right. What else is wrong with the Royal Commission? Well, the terms of reference are, are quite skewed. Um, at the heart of any public health response is a weighing up of costs and benefits. For example, the benefit of stopping the spread of the pandemic by closing schools has to be weighed against the costs to well-being from foregone schooling and social interaction. Now, I think probably New Zealand comes out very well on that score mm. because we had fewer days of school closure than most countries. But nevertheless, at the heart of the assessment is the weighing up, the costs versus the benefits of what we did. Yet there's no mention in the terms of reference, nowhere is the Commission asked whether we got the balance right Instead, the focus is on whether our elimination and later minimisation and protection strategies were effective in limiting the spread of the virus. But of course, that's only one side of the equation. So it's stilted towards assessing whether what we did we could have done better rather than... When should we have done what we did? Should we have done what we did? That's a good point. Uh, it's, it's also a little troubling... Um, uh, that in the published summary of the terms of reference, there's no reference whatsoever to our decision to shut the border. It's only when you go digging into the order in council that you find there's a reference to the movement of, pe of people across the border being within the terms of reference for the um, commission. But you would have thought that when we r shut the border and rationed places for a million Kiwis yes, wanting yeah. to return that that would be front and centre. Should a liberal democracy ever close its border on its citizens? And, and I, I think that the team of five million, looking back at the, um, looking back at the uh, at the pandemic, will think, well, actually, that was something that we should have done better. But it, it but it, it, there's no suggestion that that's to be a focus of the of the royal commission. Um, so I'd I'd like to have seen that um, up and up and up front and centre. All right. Anything else? One, one final aspect. Um, the terms of reference expressly preclude or appear to... Uh, well, no, they do expressly preclude inquiry into mistakes in particular situations. And that's because the terms of reference explicitly state that how and when strategies or other me measures were implemented or applied in particular situations or to particular individuals are out of scope. Now, I can understand it in relation to particular individuals, but they're not going to want to have a year of particular stories. Oh, and finger particular pointing, interest. basically, yeah. Yes, but particular situations raises a worry. What does that, what does that mean? Does that mean we're not going to look at where the border guards were tested and as, as promised, as we were told they were in July mm. 2020? Uh, we're not going to look at delays in, in, in the particular procurement of the Pfizer vaccine. Because unless we look into what happened in particular situations, we won't learn the lessons we need to. All right. I think those are all valid and uh, moderately expressed criticisms, not saying that it's part of a global conspiracy or Klaus Schwab's involved in writing the, the terms of reference, uh, Roger. Um <laughs> Can that be? Can your concerns be addressed or corrected 
And is they, it well? Well, can they? Do you think they they can be? If 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 the the the, the yes and no. So the, the government can make clear that the border should be a, a, a principal focus. Um, and, and if the if they've got the wording wrong and they've cast it the, the carve out too widely, this this particular situation's out of scope carve out that can be tweaked. Um, the um, predisposition of Blake the Lee. chair, that's probably something that can't be changed. Yeah. Well, I guess then your hope would be, and I do note that once it starts sitting, the government can't get involved. There's a $15 million budget. It sets up. It, it runs its own process, if you like. Um, you might hope then that the people on the Royal Commission take their job really seriously and maybe they move on their own volition yeah. to reinterpret the terms of reference they've been given and perhaps pursue angles the government weren't so keen on, on being pursued. And I would think there is an example in our lifetimes of a Royal Commission of Inquiry where the person who was a judge in charge of it was looking for the truth, no matter what the government wanted, and that's Peter Mann and the Erebus uh, Royal Commission. That's right. And I think the more there is criticism of the terms of reference or questioning of them, the more likely it is that we'll get the Royal Commission we need. All right. Well, look, we've talked about Roger Blakely, who is an epidemiologist, so in some terms on first blush... Tony, Tony Blakely. Tony Blakely. We look at him and we say, OK, so... He's got some chops in this, but because of his involvement in Victoria, might be the wrong person. What about the other people on the commission? Do you think they they balance them out? Maybe they they do well. Yes, yes and no. Uh, uh, John Whitehead, Treasury Secretary, uh, he will bring an economic focus. He's an economist, so I think the balance of the I think the balance of the panel is pretty good. Uh, a former politician um, recognizing that. Uh, while well, many of the decisions um, uh, the, the decisions are informed by the science and by the evidence that uh, there's, there's an element of real politic involved um, and and it's easy to look back and be wise with the benefit of hindsight um, so and I think the balance of the of the commission is pretty good um, I'm just concerned about the whether it's mm. well I've expressed the concern yeah, yeah. Um, Roger also you know mm, Hindsight's perfect, isn't it? It's, it's 2020. The fact is, as we move into the post-COVID world, or we hope we're moving into the post-COVID world, God, it's difficult at times uh, in the job I do, shouldn't our focus and critique be on the decisions being made now to reinvigorate our economy, um, to deal with some monetary policy that's left us with a hangover uh, from, from, from COVID, do you think we would be making a st mistake as a nation, I don't know, as media, as body politic, if this exercise in reviewing a crisis that has largely passed supersedes dealing with the problems as a nation that New Zealand has right now? Uh, yes, but I think it's for the politicians of the day to deal with the, pro the problems in front of them. Um, I wouldn't want this Royal Commission to be um, trying to work out how we, we should be running the country now. It's not qualified to do that. Um, it, it's very much got to be evaluating what we did in the past so that we can learn lessons for the future. Mm. Roger, we've had quite a few people from the initiative on the last six or seven months on the platform and they've made valuable contributions, certainly to my understanding and our audience's understanding of where New Zealand is at and, and the challenges facing us. Um, as it is the end of the year, I'm going to ask you just to project into next year, which is an election year, so it will be hot in terms of politics and rhetoric. From the initiative's point of view, from the work that you are doing, what is the issue next year for getting the country really going again, getting it operating at more than 80% or 70%? The first first challenge is to get inflation under control because without stable without stable prices the economy can't operate effectively 
Uh, and that's going to be a very painful process. Um, you and I are old enough to remember as adults the last time we had to grapple with this in the late 70s and, and, and 80s. Uh, and it was an extremely difficult um, process, which is why uh, central banks um, have had such a singular focus over the last 30 years on keeping stable prices. And we lost sight of that, unfortunately, over the last five years, not just us, um, but central banks around the world. Um, so I think that's the, that's the first challenge. Um, we've got to do something about uh, access to labour. Uh, we are crippling m many parts of our economy with um, immigration policy that is too tight. Uh, the, there's a mistaken belief that if you screw down um, the availability of, of, of um, foreign labour, uh, uh, that, that will push productivity up here. There's no economic evidence for that. Um, all it's doing is creating supply chain, strain, uh, supply chain constraints and, and forcing prices up. Um, the the long-term challenge for the country, uh, and uh, this is what I'd like the, the next government of whatever shade to be primarily focused on, is improving our ailing education system. Uh, we were once the envy of the world. Um, uh, a survey a few years ago by the Tertiary Education Commission said that 40% of New Zealanders uh, students who left school with NCA Level 2 were functionally illiterate. Yeah, and functionally, yeah. yeah. You can't you can't have a high you can't have a high highly productive high wage economy unless um, kid, uh, kids leaving school can read an instruction manual. And at least they and at least they go to school in the first place, Roger. Yeah. Yeah, and there's just been a general un there's a sense of a general unraveling taking place kids attending school, the state of crime, mm. um, uh, and, and we're at risk of, uh, of losing our social cohesion as a country. So there needs to be an exercise in bringing the nation back together again. Mm. Um, and you would say uh, so those issues outstrip in some ways the Royal Commission and what might it, it might say about what went on in the past? Uh, no, absolutely, uh, I, I do. I know the Royal Commission's got an important job to do because there will be future pandemics. Um, the Royal Commission also has a job to, to, to do bringing the country together um, and when, when looking back at the pandemic response and acknowledging the hardships that people suffered. Mm. But I think the, 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 the challenge is far greater than that. Yeah. Um, Roger, thank you for that. That's got me, got me thinking in, in terms of particular um, uh, Tony Blakely as the head and maybe he would have been a good member and a you know, a jurist, a, a judge, a, as the um, as the lead might yep. have been a better idea. Uh, now that I think about it, maybe there's time to change that. I also would like to thank the initiative for its work and contribution to the platform this year. I don't know if we'll be talking to you, you folk again, um, but certainly on issues like education a, a, and the economy and monetary policy, your people have been fantastic in terms of their accessibility and the way they can explain sometimes complex ideas in a straightforward way that most of our uh, audience and I can understand. So I'd like to thank the initiative for that in the year 2022 and look forward to dealing with you people and talking again in the new year. Many thanks, Sean. All right. Roger, um, uh, uh, Roger Partridge there from um, the New Zealand Initiative. And that's an interesting take, OK? I welcome the Royal Commission. And I thought its terms of reference were all right. I think he raised some valid points if you've got thoughts about that. Give us a ring. And also, if you've got thoughts on um, just how how useful it is to, I don't know, look back in hindsight and try and get everything, try and fix everything after it's happened. Uh, we will have pandemics again. But I think what we learned was having a plan. Well, the plan went out the window pretty well straight away when we had a pandemic. Maybe we need to train our health people and our policy makers and our those who take control in a situation like that, not on exactly what to do, but how to think, how philosophically you react in real time in a smart way to the challenges that a pandemic um, puts before a country. As I say, I, I think generally, and I agree with Roger, I think generally New Zealand didn't do too bad, but maybe it could have been less painful. Maybe we could have... Um, excluded fewer people and actually shown a little more kindness or a little more tolerance for the human condition in the way that we responded to the pandemic. But we have not had a huge 
um, death toll and our health system didn't collapse, which was really the reason for doing all the stuff we did was a fear that the health system would collapse.